Our scripture reading tonight is from 2 Timothy chapter 3. And just while you're turning up the page, can I thank the Reverend Baker for the words of welcome and the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight, and it's a pleasure to be able to open the Word of God and to be able to preach the gospel. And I trust as we gather around God's open Word that He will be pleased to speak to each of our hearts. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you have your Bible with you, and we will read from the verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learnt, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learnt them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Amen. And may God's blessing be upon his holy and inspired word. It's the words of verses 15 and 16 I'd like to leave with you uh, tonight. Paul says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He then explains that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, one of the questions that many people throughout the world have today is this. If God is real, why doesn't he reveal himself to us in some way? And that is a question that many genuine people ask concerning God. If he is real, why doesn't he reveal himself to us? I remember doing some outreach in England a number of years ago. And this is one of the common questions that I would often have been asked. And I remember a young lady asking me this question, if God is real, why doesn't he reveal himself in some way so that we know for certainty? And I said, well, what would you like God to do? Would you like him to come and and live here on this earth for a period of time and then maybe a book can be written about him? And she said, that would be perfect. That would be exactly uh, what would cause me to believe in God. And then once I said, well, actually, God has done that. The Lord Jesus Christ is God, manifest in the flesh. And he did live here for over 30 years. And we have a book that tells us all about him. And then she said, ah, but that's not what I was thinking. The problem that many people have today is that they want God to appear in the exact way that they want. They want God to jump through their hoops 
before they will believe upon him. And they say, God, if you would only reveal yourself in the exact way that I have described, then I would believe. Well, dear friend, what an audacious thing to say. What an arrogant thing to say that the great God of heaven and earth should jump whenever we tell him to jump and he should speak when we tell him to speak. Imagine saying to our king, uh, I will only accept you as my king if you'll be able to do a handstand for two minutes. The king would say, well, I'm not going to do that just so that you accept that I'm your king. I'm your king regardless of whether you uh, have me do a handstand or not. And so God is real. And God exists and we should never demand that God reveals himself in our way because God has revealed himself in his way. So let's look at this tonight. The question that we're looking at is, has God spoken? And I have three short headings just to leave with you about this subject tonight. Has God spoken? Well, of course, the answer is yes. And the first way is through the Bible. Because the Bible is God's special revelation to us. God reveals himself to us through the world in two main ways. There is what we call the revelation of nature. We look out at the world and we know there's a God because everything that has been created has a creator. As you go back to your home tonight and you put your key in the lock, that lock didn't make itself had a creator. The key had a a creator, an inventor as well. As you turn on the electricity and the light bulb comes on, again, the light bulb didn't make itself. As you get, get into your car, it didn't make itself. Everything that has been intricately made has a creator and a designer. Well, there is nothing more detailed than your human body. And it didn't come about by chance. God made you. He made everything. So there's natural revelation, but natural revelation has a limitation and it has a shortfall. It shows us that there is a God, but it doesn't show us how we can know God. It doesn't show us how we can be saved and how we can be forgiven our sins, which is why God has a second form of revelation, and that is the Bible. We call this God's special revelation or his supernatural revelation. Because in the Bible, dear friends, God reveals to us everything that he wants us to know about him, everything he wants us to know about us, and everything he wants us to know about the way of salvation. The Bible is how God reveals himself to us. Now you may be thinking, but does God not reveal himself in other ways? in dreams and visions and things like that. Well, as we read through the Bible, we do see that God has revealed himself in different ways. He appeared to Moses at a burning bush. He sent angels, and those angels brought messages at different times. We hear on occasions of God speaking from heaven and people hearing audibly the voice of God. We can think of miracles that have been done and we can think of dreams and visions that that God used to communicate to men. But these things were only temporary until the Bible was complete. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth Um, He he said of things that were temporary, uh, provisional, until that which is promised be complete. And once God gives the Bible, the complete canon of Scripture, this this book contains everything that God wants you and I to know. He has nothing else to add by a dream or a vision. Sadly, today there are many people, and they're saying, the Bible's not enough. The Bible isn't enough of God speaking to us. We need more. And there's some people uh, today believe they are prophets and they claim to be getting messages from God. And if that's the case, dear friend, do you know what that means? It means that the Bible's redundant. It means that there's no need for the Bible. It means that the Bible is outdated, it's antiquated, it should be put on the bookshelf, it has no relevance for us today. We should be going and getting the latest update from the latest prophet who's getting these dreams and visions. But that's not what God has planned. There is no more revelation that God has to give to us today. Everything that we want to know is found in this book. And you know, if there's something that's not taught to us from this book, it's because God doesn't want us to know it. 
It's part of the hidden things of God. God reveals himself to us. The problem today with many cults that have appeared, and we can think of some like the Jehovah's Witness and the Mormons, these are men who have come forward. They've claimed that they've had a revelation from God, but the problem is, first of all, God hasn't given them a revelation. Secondly, their revelation contradicts the, the Bible, Holy Scripture. It takes men off in another direction. It doesn't add anything to the Bible. It completely contradicts it. And we see this today, sadly, even within uh, modern Pentecostalism and the charismatic movements where, where preachers are standing up and they're not preaching the Word of God. They're, they're telling uh, people about a dream or vision they've had. That is not how God reveals himself to us. God gives the uttermost preeminence to his Word. The psalmist says, thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God does not give prophets today. He gives preachers who preach not their thoughts, but preach the word of God. This is what God has ordained. And this is what God uses. So has God spoken? Yes, he speaks through the Bible. The Bible is his revelation to us. Well, secondly here tonight. Has God spoken? Yes, he's spoken through the Bible. And the Bible is a supernatural book. <clears throat> the Bible is different from every other book that has ever been written. The Bible is different from every book that you have on your bookshelf. It exceeds every other book because the Bible has a supernatural author. The Bible has a divine author. The Bible is a book that comes directly from God. You'll notice in our verse tonight, the Apostle Paul says in verse 15 uh, to Timothy that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture, because that's what the Bible is. It is a holy book. It is Scripture. It comes from God himself. And he goes on in verse 16 to tell us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, what does that mean? You'll find some people banding about that term inspiration very loosely and casually. If a footballer has a good match, they will say he was inspired today. Well, what do they mean by that? I'm not entirely sure what they mean by that. What they mean is he was, he was playing beyond himself. It's as if he had help from beyond uh, his own ability uh, today. Well, the Bible is inspired because it comes from the mouth of God himself. In the Greek, which is the language the New Testament was written in, that word inspiration literally means God breathed out. So dear friends, we should never look at the Bible casually. We should never look at the Bible uh, flippantly either because this is a holy book. It is breathed out from the mouth of God himself. Many today are saying, if God is real, why doesn't he speak to us? We hold our Bible up, we wave our Bible, and we say God does speak, and he speaks through this book. This is a book that God has given to communicate to you and to me. Sadly today, many don't treat the Bible as the holy scripture that it is. They mock it. They denigrate it. Uh, they relegate it to being a, a book of fiction, but it's not. It is a supernatural book. It is divinely inspired. And dear friends, from the first word of Genesis to the last word of Revelation, this is the complete word of God. Now, some critics, they'll try to uh, cause unbelief in the Bible. And they will try to say, no, no, it's not really the word of God. It's the mixture of men's writings and God's word. Well, that's not true at all. From beginning to end, this is the word of God. How do we know that? Well, the apostle Peter, 2 Peter 1, 21, he said, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So yes, there were human writers who wrote down the Bible, but God the Holy Spirit moved these human writers to record not just the general thought or outline, but every word of God perfectly. So this isn't a book written by men. God used men, but the Holy Spirit moved them to record every word perfectly. And because it comes from God, there's no mistakes. There's no errors. There's no contradictions at all to be found in the Bible. Now, some people like to come up and they like to say, well, um, I went on Google and I typed in contradictions in the Bible and it brought up this one. 
and uh, people would maybe come and try to present a contradiction. But dear friends, all the contradictions that are supposed to be in the Bible all have answers. The problem doesn't lie with the fact that um, uh, men uh, believe there's contradictions in the Bible. The problem lies with the fact that men don't want the Bible to be true. There's not a single contradiction. I remember uh, a person came to me one time and claimed they had a contradiction in the Bible. So I went away and did all the hard work for them and came back and presented it to them. There's not a contradiction uh, at, at all. And they said, oh, thanks. I did all the hours of work for them. So now in future, if somebody says there's a contradiction, I say, well, go and study it yourself and you'll find that there's not. When I was at school, one of the subjects I hated was um, algebra. Never got to grips with algebra in, in maths. And I'm dreading when my children come to algebra. Uh, I hope their mother's better at it than I was. But um, just because I didn't understand algebra and I couldn't do algebra, it doesn't mean that the teacher was wrong, that the textbook was wrong, or that algebra was wrong. The fault lay with me not being able to understand the subject. And so we don't come to the Bible and say, well, I don't understand this, so therefore the Bible must be wrong. No, what a proud spirit that is to say that, that my mind is just so great and wonderful that I know everything, and if I don't understand this in the Bible, it must be wrong. No, if there's something we don't understand, the fault doesn't lie with the Word of God. It's perfect. The fault lies with us, and we are to educate ourselves to understand what the Word is. But this, dear friends is a holy book. Paul refers to it as holy scripture. Everything about God is holy. He's holy in his being. He's holy in his thoughts. He's holy in his words. He's holy in everything. So the word that comes from him is a holy word. It's a perfect word. It's a pure word. Proverbs 30 verse 5 reminds us, every word of God is pure. So we have before us tonight in our hands a book that excels all other books, because it's a holy book. That can't be said of the dictionary in your bookshelf. That can't be said of the cookbook in your kitchen. It can only be said of the Bible. It's a holy book because it comes from the mouth of a holy God. But more than that, it's also a living word. Because think about it. The Bible is the word that comes from the mouth of the Lord who is living and alive forevermore. And because it comes from God, it's a living word that is relevant in every single age. There's some books today that are completely irrelevant. My grandfather was a chemist and he was famous in Lurgan for his um, cough medicine. And many people uh, today would still tell me about my grandfather's cough medicine. And I asked my uncle about it a couple of years ago and he said, yes, I've still got the recipe for your uh, grandfather's cough medicine, but we're not allowed to make it anymore. There's some of those ingredients that would be deemed to be illegal today. So we're not allowed to use that recipe anymore. So my grandfather's famous recipe for his cough syrup is outdated because some of the great ingredients are, are no longer allowed to be consumed. But I was in a bookshop, um, a secondhand bookshop in the summertime, and I came across a user's guide for Windows 2000. And I looked at that book and I thought, well, that book's only, what, 20 25 years uh, since it was printed, but it has to be one of the most irrelevant books today. Hope I'm not offending anybody, but, but who still uses Windows 2000? Who's going to walk into a, a secondhand bookshop and say, there's the book that I've been waiting for to help me with? It, it's an out-of-date book. It's an irrelevant book. But dear friends, that can never be said of the Bible. The Bible, though it is thousands of years old, is as relevant for us today as it was in the day that God gave it. The words that God spoke to Moses were applicable to Moses, and they were applicable to Moses' children. And then to David, they were applicable in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're applicable to us today. Why? Because this is a living word. It's a living word that comes from the mouth of a living God. It has relevance. The Lord Jesus Christ taught us how living this word was. In rebuking the devil in Matthew chapter 24, during his temptation, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but he shall live by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. You see, God gave his word to be a living word to make us alive and to enable us to live the lives that he, he wants us to live. 
Think back to the Garden of Eden. God gave Adam the word, the word to live by. And as long as Adam obeyed the word of God, he lived. Adam sadly disobeyed the word of God. But God has given us a word that you and I are to live by. It contains the gospel. It contains the message of salvation. It contains the way of eternal life. This is the book that God has given for us to live by. The word of God that he has given to us. And God has preserved his word. Remarkably. Down through the years. In every age and generation. God has preserved this book. Many men have sought to destroy it. Many men have sought to obliterate it. We can think prior to the Reformation whenever um, uh, John Wycliffe uh, was engaged in translating uh, the Bible into English. He had men write it out by hand and they travel around uh, preaching the word. Many were converted once they heard the word of God. But they had uh, opposition, men who sought to uh, claim their manuscripts, claim their Bibles and burnt them. At the time of the Protestant Reformation with William Tyndale, his only charge, he was guilty of translating the Bible into English so that people could read the word of God for themselves. They gathered his Bibles, they burnt him, burnt those Bibles, and then they burnt him simply for translating the Bible. But God has promised in his word, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The Lord Jesus Christ preached in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And dear friends, over the last 6,000 years, many religions have come and gone. Many religious leaders have been established. Many religious books have been written, but there's one that will endure to the end of the age. And it's God's word. It's the Bible. It will never fail, regardless of the attacks. And it's also a prophetic word. Everything that God has prophesied in the Bible has come to pass. Those ones that have been fulfilled, there's still some yet to be fulfilled. But with great accuracy, the word of God has been fulfilled. Now we can see that uh, some uh, charlatans, some counterfeit men, they make these prophecies that the world is going to end in 1999 and uh, the world's going to end in um, uh, such a year and they never come to pass. They've been found to be false prophets, counterfeits. That can never be said about the word of God. It is a prophetic word that always comes to be fulfilled. Because this book is a supernatural book. It is a book from God himself. Thirdly and finally here tonight. The Bible is God's communication. Many people are saying, if God is real, why doesn't he communicate to us? In some way. Why, why isn't there a word from God? Why have I been left without God speaking to me? If only God was real. Why wouldn't he communicate to me? Well the answer is that God has communicated to you. And he communicates to you through this book. And it's not a small book. It's not a, a brief communication. It's a full communication. God has much to say to me and to you. The Bible, dear friend, is God speaking. Anytime you want to hear the voice of God, open the Bible, read the words, and that is God's voice communicating to you. Over 3,800 times, the Bible uses a phrase like, God said, or thus saith the Lord. 3,800 times, we have it repeated for us over and over and over again. God said, thus saith the Lord, to remind us But this isn't men speaking. This is God communicating to us. But you know the best thing about the Bible is the person it communicates. Because the Bible communicates the Son of God. This book is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 5 verse 39, the Lord was speaking to the Jews. Now remember, there was no New Testament written at that stage. There was no Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They only had the Old Testament. And the Lord said to these Jews, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So he told the Jews that the Old Testament testifies of me. He says the whole of the Old Testament is about me. And then, of course, the New Testament is about him as well. So the whole of the Bible is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it for a moment. If the Lord Jesus Christ never came into this world as that babe in the manger in Bethlehem, born of the Virgin Mary. 
how much of the Bible would we have? You maybe think, well, we'd have the Old Testament. The answer is no, we wouldn't. We wouldn't have anything. Because if God didn't send his son into this world to be our savior, there would be no communication to us. Because the whole of the Old Testament, the whole of the New Testament, is about Christ coming into this world to be our savior and to be our redeemer. If he never came, there would be no Bible. There would be no message. Many people today, they say, if God cares, if God loves, why doesn't he show us in some way? Well, again, we can hold our Bible and we can say, this book is an evidence that God does love. It's an evidence that God does care because this book is God's love letter to us. This book declares that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the book of Jesus Christ. Going back to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God was to put them out of the garden, but not without a promise. He promised Adam and Eve the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head. That is, there would be one born who would defeat the works of the devil and the works of darkness and be the savior of the world. And the whole history of the Old Testament points to Jesus coming. Every psalm sings of him. Every prophet points to him. This is the book of Jesus Christ. That's why it's so special. It's the book that communicates the gospel message. You and I wouldn't know the way of salvation except by this book. There's many people today and they're trying to get to heaven and they're trying to have peace with God their way. And many people today think, well, if I just be a good person, that will please God. They've just invented their own way of salvation. Many people think, well, if I give all my money to a church or a charity, God will let me into heaven. They've invented their own way of salvation. Dear friend, we're not to do that. God has one way of salvation. And where do we find that message of salvation? In the Bible. This whole book teaches us the message of salvation. And it's not complicated. When Paul and Silas were in a jail in Philippi, the jailer came in to them and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they told him the simple gospel message. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And dear friend, that's the message of the gospel in a simple nutshell. That's what God wants you and I to do. To believe on his son that he sent into this world to be the savior. And just so that message didn't get lost by word of mouth. So, uh, and us passing it on to our children and remembering it correctly. God put it in a book. And he preserved this book. And has it passed down to us today? This book communicates salvation. In Psalm 119 verse 9, there's a great question that is asked. It says, wherewithal, that is how or by what means, shall a young man cleanse his way? The answer, by taking heed thereto, according to thy word. How can a person be forgiven their sins? How can a person be reconciled to God? By taking heed to the word of God. Not following their own thoughts and ideas. Not inventing their own religion. But by listening to God's word. And following God's word. And obeying God's word. Now there's some people and they say, well if I became a Christian tonight, I couldn't live as a Christian. I would fail. I would make mistakes. I know that I would, I, I would fall away. Well, whenever you become a Christian, it doesn't mean you become perfect. It doesn't mean you become a saint. Uh, Christians are those who make mistakes too. And many people say, well, I wouldn't even know where to begin. I wouldn't even know how to live as a Christian. Well, again, dear friend, God has given a book that teaches us and instructs us how we are to live as Christians. But he helps us. Peter says that we are kept by the power of God. Once we come to repent and believe the gospel, the Lord gives to us the aid of the Holy Spirit. We're quickened by God the Holy Spirit and he helps us and guides us. Paul, in verse 16 of our chapter, after he mentions that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, he highlights just how important the Bible is. He says, and is profitable. Dear friends, the most profitable thing to you in this world that you can hold in your hand is not a vast amount of money. It's not some super medicine. It's the word of God. 
the most profitable thing that God has given for you and for me in this life is his word. And what's it profitable for? It's profitable for doctrine. That word very simply means teaching. Because the problem is, even though we think we know it all, the reality is we don't know it all. We need to be taught. And God has given us his word to teach us. He's given preachers to preach the word, to teach it as well. It's also profitable for reproof. That is, whenever we make mistakes. Now, we all like to think that, uh, that we're perfect and we never make any mistakes at all. And we all like to think that our, our theology is perfect as well. It's not. We make mistakes. But God has given us his word to correct us whenever we make mistakes. It's profitable for reproof, for correction. And it's also profitable, Paul says, for instruction in righteousness. Because the biggest problem that you and I have is that we're not righteous. In fact, we're unrighteous. We are sinners by nature and by the deeds that we do. So God has given us this book. He doesn't say, you're unrighteous, there's no hope. No, he's given us this book to instruct us in righteousness. So coming to a close here tonight, the question we've been looking at is, has God spoken? And the answer undoubtedly is yes. God has spoken and God is still speaking. He's still speaking through his word. He hasn't finished speaking to you and to me and, and, and to men and women in Newton Hearts and Ulster and Ireland throughout the world tonight. He is still speaking. But I think a, a bigger question that we really ought to think about is, why would God speak to us? Why would he speak to sinners who have broken his law day and daily? Why would he speak to those who have rejected his offers of mercy in the gospel? Why would God be so patient and long-suffering with us because we don't deserve it? Why would God send his son to die on that cross of Calvary on our behalf? Why would God have his son go through such agony in order to save wretches such as you and me? We cannot even begin to fathom that question. Why would God communicate to us at all? We don't deserve communication from God. It's a miracle that he communicates to us because the Bible says He's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. And God, dear friend, desires tonight that you would not dismiss his word, that you would receive the gospel, that you would believe the gospel, that you would come to saving faith in his son. I'll hand back to the Reverend Baker.